And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in snugly, wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth, laid him in a manger, because there was no lodging available for them. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem in the city of David. Would you bow your heads for prayer? Our Father, on this Christmas Eve Sunday, we want to give you thanks for the gift of your Son, our Jesus, our Savior. So help this preacher to share the good news and help us all to listen to you and leave here with a renewed confidence that we can live a Christ-like life because of our Jesus. Amen and amen. After a Sunday service, a little boy approaches the pastor. Pastor Bob, when I grow up, I'm going to give you some money every single Sunday. Well, thank you, Timmy. That would be very nice, but why do you want to give me money? Because my daddy says that you're the poorest preacher we've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> we preachers are taught in homiletics class that if we want to keep your attention, then we need to be preaching a sermon that uh, has points that are clearly defined. Um, you need to always know what direction we're going in. We can't afford to be foggy in that area. Um, if we don't get your attention right away, all is lost. <laughs> um, nothing more difficult than sitting through a Sunday service and having the preacher share a boring sermon. <laughs> no boring message here in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 2. He gets right to the point, doesn't he? I mean, he has something significant to say. He is clear as can be. It's a message that I find uplifting, a message that gives us all hope, I mean, this is all around good news. And we learned right away that the source of the news is from a heavenly being. So again, let's take a look at this angelic announcement. And I think as we look at it, we will discover there's something here for us today, something we can take home, something we can use in our walk with Christ. And the first thing I see is that we have a promise of security. Now, if you have your insert and you want to read that, beginning in verse 4, Luke sets the scene for us. It's been a long, hard journey. Mary and Joseph have arrived in Bethlehem. Mary is nine months pregnant. And I'm sure that Besides being tired and hungry, we have a young girl here who is anxious and wondering about her future. And now to make matters worse, they can't find a room to rent. They have to settle for a space in a barn. And it's while they're in this barn that Mary gives birth to Jesus. To Jesus the Christ child. Just outside of town, there's some shepherds taking care of their flock. That's not an easy job. Uh, and it's nightfall, so it's doubly hard. 
Some of the shepherds are probably sleeping while others have to stand guard. It's night, it's pitch black, and their responsibility is to watch over the sheep. It's a hard job. This is their livelihood. Who knows what's out in the dark? There are predators ready to pounce and have some lamb chops for a meal. And now, and now here we are. We are given the birth announcement. And, and notice how the angels begin. The angel begins. He says in verse 10, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Well, the shepherds, minding their own business, just trying to eke out a living, take care of the, the sheep, provide for their families. And suddenly, without warning, the angel of God appears and the sky lights up and the Bible says they were terrified. You've got to be kidding. The angel says, don't be afraid. I mean, they were terrified. The fear of the unknown. Hmm. I was watching on YouTube just a couple of days ago. There was a rocket launch in the evening. And it went through the skies. And people had their phones out recording this rocket launch. Only they didn't know it was a rocket. And some of them were afraid. They were saying, it's a UFO. Uh, the Russians are going to bomb us. This is the end. Someone actually believed this was the end coming now because of this light streaking across the sky. 2,000 years ago, the sky lights up. There is absolutely no reason for this to happen. And we have some men who are, they're afraid. I mean, something unexplainable has happened. Well, today, we can relate to that. Uh, we have so much to be concerned about. So many reasons to be afraid. Not just a rocket going through the skies. We open the paper, we read about a crazy guy in North Korea who wants to start a war. We have terrorists who are setting off bombs in New York. And many of us here, maybe we're living paycheck to paycheck. And it can be scary. Our fears are only increased when we pin our hopes on various plans when something goes on in Washington who, and they try to reassure us. And what happens? So many times we're only disappointed. Hey, let's, for the last few months, uh, President Trump and the Republicans, they've been uh, working hard to reform the tax code. Now, it's never been a question whether or not we need to reform the tax code. I think it should be changed. But the argument is, how much do you cut? How large of a deficit should our country have? Uh, is this change for the middle class, or is it just going to help uh, the rich get richer? So what happened? Last week, the Republicans announced that they have finalized a tax reform legislation. Uh, they had a bill for the House and the Senate. They voted. You know what happened? Friday, the president signed into law a new tax bill, and then he went off to Florida on vacation, smiling. Well, not everyone is smiling. I mean, this is not the end. This is just the beginning. I mean, how is this going to impact us uh, as individuals? as families who are struggling. I mean, will we be better off? They say we will, but how many times has Washington interfered in our lives and they promise us one thing and it never materializes? I don't know about you, but I'm a kind of a guy who's wait and see. I, I wanna see if this is really gonna help me. And in the meantime, I find myself being just a little bit concerned. 2,000 years ago, this angelic being brought a message that God was intervening on our behalf. He intends 
to banish the fears of the earth. And in this announcement, shepherds, first they're frightened, and then they realize they matter in God's eyes. The angel said, don't be afraid. That's a message for us today. And I don't know what your fears are and what you brought to church this morning and your concerns about the future. 2018, I don't know what's going to happen in 2018, but God says, don't be afraid. He wants us to know that we do not have to be afraid because we matter in his eyes. So, whatever happens, whatever the situation is, and maybe you'll come to a place and you'll find yourself thinking, I have nowhere to turn. This is it. God will break through heaven with a message for you. Be still. Know that I am God. Don't be fearful. Stop trembling. What did you bring to our Christmas Eve service this morning? Leave it here. Leave it with Jesus. He's going to take care of you. That's what the Advent season is all about. This is what we are reminded of, that we can have a holy boldness. I mean, Jesus has redeemed his people. So we go to the Savior. We drop all of our cares and our fears in his lap. Listen, you cannot overwhelm God with your problems and you will not catch him by surprise because there's a promise of satisfaction. We have a promise right here. Again, the words of the angel, verse 10, don't be afraid. And then he says, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. That includes us, all people, great joy. And more than ever, we need some good news, don't we? Uh, we've become, become a people on an endless search for joy and happiness. And for 11 months out of the year, we struggle and we look for something that will bring us some peace and happiness. And then we come to December and we circle December the 25th on our calendar and we believe somehow, I haven't found joy, but this day here is Christmas. So surely I'll be joyful on December the 25th. So many people are doing that. And then January 1st rolls around. And we discover that we have very little happiness, not much joy, no satisfaction. So many of us will wake up on January the 1st with an empty feeling. Nothing has changed. Dorothy Sayers said this, Today belongs to the soundbite. Tomorrow to marketing. Eternity belongs to the truth. If you live only for this world, you will care little for truth. Let us eat, drink, and be merry. But if you live for eternity, you will forego a few fads in order to be everlastingly relevant. Hmm. So many disappointed souls, and we get caught up in it, and we listen to the call, eat, drink, be merry, you'll be happy. I found a new restaurant, the food is great, I'll take a picture, everyone on Facebook is going to like it. <laughs> so many people looking for joy, looking in the wrong places, <laughs> looking for a sound bite. But when a person is concerned with everlasting relevance, when a person has sold out completely, and they are serving God, then you're living for eternity. And, and the search brings satisfaction. 
Don't you want to be satisfied on this Christmas, during this Christmas season? I do. The angel's message to the shepherds, I bring you good news. It'll bring great joy to all people. Now, going back 2,000 years, the message, I bring you great joy to all people. And then 30 years later, Jesus is now an adult and he begins his ministry. He's gathered with him 12 disciples who will help him. And he walks around sharing the good news, the joy, the great news everywhere he went. And if you study the scriptures, then you know that wherever Jesus went, there was happiness. He described the Christian experience as, as a wedding party when he changed water to wine and people were happy. The, the joy of finding a pearl of great price, a story of joy and happiness. The happiness of a prodigal son returning to his family. The joy of a father. I believe with all my heart that God wants us to embrace this message that Jesus brings great joy to all people. Great joy because we have a promise of salvation. In verse 10, again, the angel said, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. And then he says, the Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. We need to take this in for just a moment. I mean, the full sweep of this wonderful salvation right here pronounced by an angel the Savior the Hebrew word used here literally means the rescuer Jesus the deliverer and then the angel said the Messiah a lot of translations read the Christ a reference to Jesus being the promised one, the anointed one. And then finally the angel adds that he is the Lord. The miracle of Christmas is that God came to rescue us in our deepest dilemma. And make no mistake, at this time, as in our time, mankind was lost and they were in darkness and Jesus made a way so that no person need perish. No person need be disappointed. Jesus grappled decisively with sin and he won and we can be free. As a result, if we give ourselves to the Lord. Last night I was watching television and they interviewed Billy Graham's son. Boy, does he sound like dad. And you know what? He sounds like dad because the message that he shared on nationwide TV was a simple message. You need Jesus as Lord and Savior. You need to repent of your sins and go to the cross, ask him to forgive you, and you can know freedom. He shared this simple message on national TV, and I thought, oh, what joy, what hope we have. This is the joy of that first Christmas promise, a promise of salvation. There, there's a beautiful story that I came across years ago and I've saved it, and I like to share it every now and then. Maybe you've heard this, if not. There were three trees talking, talking about their dreams of the future. The first tree said that he would like to be made into a beautiful handcrafted cradle so that he might be a living support for a, a baby child. The second tree wanted to be made into a large sailing ship so that he could just sail around the world on the oceans and 
um, carry important cargo, take people to exotic places. The third tree longed to stay right where he was. He wanted to grow taller and taller and point everyone to God, remind them that there is a God in heaven. Three trees. Those were the dreams. One wanted to be a cradle. The other wanted to be a large ship. And the third, a tall tree pointing people to God. Well, one day the woodcutters came and chopped down all three trees, destroying their dreams. The first tree was fashioned into a simple feeding trough, a manger for animals. But the manger was sold to a family in Bethlehem. And on the night that Jesus was born, a simple feed box became the cradle for the Christ child. The second tree was fashioned into a boat, but not the kind he had dreamed of. It was just a tiny, inexpensive fishing boat. A fellow by the name of Peter bought the boat. And one afternoon, when the crowds were pressing in, Jesus stood on that boat and he preached the good news. The third tree who wanted to remain where he was at and grow tall pointing people to God was cut down and he was shaped into an instrument of torture. The tree became a cross and it was on the cross that Jesus was crucified and sacrificed himself for our sins. Three trees, they were humbled. They were denied their dreams and cut down. But because they were a part of God's plan, they were exalted. This is the promise of salvation. When we, in our humility, we give ourselves to God, our Lord can do great things with us. Four years ago, I came to this church on a January to fill the pulpit for one Sunday and preach a sermon and say goodbye. One of the parishioners approached me and said, would you consider staying here and being our pastor? And I remember my answer, no. You're looking for someone younger, with a family. That's what you need. I had another family took me out to breakfast right after the service. And they tried their best to convince me I should really stay here and be the pastor. And again, I answered and said, no, I'm really not looking for a church. And now I'm finishing up four years here. And I remember when I finally relented and I said, yes, I will be the pastor. <laughs> I thought I was doing you a favor. But on June of 2017, the doctors diagnosed me with stage four cancer. And I realized God didn't bring me here to help you. God brought me here for you to help me. And that's what you've been doing. And you've been praying for me. And you give me words of encouragement. And when I'm scared, I know I have a congregation who's going to lift me up. You see, my plan was to come one Sunday and leave. God's plan was to keep me here for this moment in my life. This is the promise of Christmas. This is the essence of the angel's announcement. God has a plan for us. We, we may not see it clearly right away, but don't be afraid. You just say, yes, God, I will follow you. No message ever preached was more significant than that of an angel on the first Christmas Eve, a message for us 
a message of security, a message of satisfaction, and a message of salvation. And amen.